Good morning. Every once in a while, amazing people come into our lives. Nicole is one of those. She doesn't know I was going to say this. We are so blessed to have her. I don't care what Vic says about her, all the bad things. No, Vic has never said a single bad thing that I've heard. Uh, we are so blessed to have Vic and Nicole as part of our family here. So I'm looking forward to her speaking to us today. I normally avoid drawing your attention to any of the announcements in the bulletin, but I'm going to make a couple of exceptions today. Uh, first, just to remind you that we have a potluck picnic, picnic this afternoon at David and Connie Drexler's. As the old saying goes, be there or be square. It's a great time to fellowship, and I really appreciate getting to know the church family, those of you who show up. It's a blessing. Second, this one I'm announcing because I know for the seven years that I led out in juniors, how important the outdoor activities are. Three o'clock this afternoon, Pathfinders hike details in the bulletin, so I encourage you to participate in those. Um, and before we do the membership transfers, Kari had a little word she wanted to say. As you know, we had our Glow Mom event last Sunday, and I just wanted to thank everybody personally for whatever contribution you made to it, it was very much appreciated. Uh, whether you were there, whether you helped in the kitchen, whether you supplied stuff, um, it was a wonderful day. It was wonderful weather. We were able to be under shady trees and uh, the Lord blessed. And thank you so much for your contributions. So I have a couple of questions for the kiddos out there. So I know some of you have started school. We had our oldest start kindergarten this uh, week at SLA, so we are very excited about that. But if you started school, can you raise your hand? Okay, now the next question, keep your ears tuned in. If you're ages three through 10, can you raise your hand? Okay, I'll raise them higher, raise them higher. Don't. Don't be shy. All right, so this announcement is mostly for you and for your grown-ups. So go ahead, put those hands down. So Hector and I are going to be restarting Adventurers starting in September. So our first, yes, it's so exciting. Uh, we have so many positive ministries in this church. And this is one that is deeply close to us because our children are both in that age bracket. And so during children's story or afterwards, we'll be passing out these little cards. These cards have two sides. The first side will give parents and adults some information about adventurers. The second side is a calendar because we all need a lot of um, reminding for things in our lives. It also gives you some ideas about when our investiture program is, when our induction program is, and things like Christmas parties. So we are very excited, and um, I invite all of the kids, young at heart and a little older, to join us. We hope to see you all there. Please tell your friends. Everyone's invited. Have a happy Sabbath. Thank you. Thank you. That takes a lot of energy to do those kind of things. That's why parents are young. <laughs> Three weeks from today, if I've calculated correctly, we'll be worshiping at Camp Winnipeg. And if you wish to join us for the meal, be sure to sign up. Details in the bulletin. Okay, let us go to the membership transfers. We have a second reading today for transferring in. Colette Brown from Gardner 
and Robert O'Leary from the Village Church. Are either of you here today? Uh, okay, there's, there's Bob. Welcome, Bob. And uh, do, is Colette here? I don't see. Okay. Is there a motion to accept these transfers? So moved, second. Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. And of course, we don't even bother with the opposed because we know it's universal. It's unanimous. Um, and that includes going out Michelle and Ashley Hunt to West Boylston. So thank you very much. We're going to do the call to worship before the invocation. As you see in your bulletin, today's um, call to worship is inspired by passages from the Bible in Romans 12, 2, John 17, 14 through 19. I'm going to read the light colored text and the congregation will please repeat the bold type text together in unison. We are called to be people of faith in the midst of the world. So we mix our worship and our work, our faith and our life. We gather here as people who live in the world and yet we gather as people who have been called to see the world from a different viewpoint. God has called us together. God has called us to be part of a community. God challenges us to consider questions of priority as we engage with the world. In this time together, may God open our hearts, minds, and eyes, allowing us to see deeper, helping us to live in the world while still offering a challenge to the ways of the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please bow your heads with me. Dear loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath, Lord. We thank you for this privilege and pleasure to gather together here. Bless us, Lord. Send us your Holy Spirit. Speak through the pastor. Speak to each of our hearts, Lord. May we hear the message from heaven you would have for us all. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It is now time for our children's offering and the children's story. So any young people or anyone who is young at heart that would like to come up, um, we welcome you to come forward at this time. Temperance. We call her Tempe for short, although I have a worker, a helper in my barn, who calls her Tempest, which is kind of funny because she can be a bit of a tempest sometimes, get a little excited. So Temperance is a very special dog. Of course, I think all of my animals are very special, but I have five livestock guardian dogs, and Temperance is one of them. And what do you think a livestock guardian dog does? Bark. They definitely bark. What else? Any ideas? They do what dogs do. Well, 
kind of, and it's funny you should bring that up, because livestock guardian dogs are a little bit different than your normal run-of-the-mill pet dog. I happen to get lucky with Tempe that she likes me. She loves me and she wants to make me happy, don't you, baby? Yes, she wants to make me happy, which is really nice. But you know what? Not all livestock guardian dogs are like that. Some of them kind of don't really care what you think or what you might want them to do. Tempe is a girl. And I will tell you that even sometimes Tempe doesn't like to do what I ask her to do. She's very independent. Very independent. Are any of you very independent? No. <laughs> yeah. So, hi, baby. She, <laughs> she likes to think for herself. And you know what? We let her do that a lot of the time because like other dogs, she has very keen eyesight. So she can see things, especially in the dark, that I can't see. And she can hear things. She can see strangers. Yes, she can see strangers. And that's exactly one of the things I want her to do. Well, no? Oh, well. She can also help people. She can also help people, it's true. But what she does, she's kind of a partner. They, yes, that is true. So, what she does is she protects, back to my initial question, what do you think livestock guardian dogs do? She lives with my sheep and goats and llama and alpaca and very close to my chickens and keeps them safe. She guards them. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. Is she a sheep? No. Is she a chicken? Is she an alpaca? Is she a goat? Is she a llama? No. So she's not the same as any of those other animals, is she? And she's even different than the house dog that I used to have. And she's different than the cats. And she's different than the parakeet and the rabbits. So, you know, she's different. And she's had to learn how to work with and live with all these other different types of animals to keep them safe. And yes, she barks whenever there's anything that is out of order. We call livestock guardian dogs order nerds because if there's anything out of order, meaning something different than the normal thing, they let us know. Hi, baby. They let us know. And they let us know by barking. Um, but the important thing is that she works well with all these other animals that are not like her. You know, that's an important thing. Do you know people that aren't like you? Maybe they look... I'm sorry? You know people that aren't like you? Yeah. So I know people that aren't like me. Maybe they look a little different. Maybe they're older. Maybe they're younger. That's not exactly the same as you. Oh, okay. Familiar people are nice. Yes. But you know what? People that aren't the same are good too. And maybe they think a little differently. Maybe they eat different food. Maybe they speak a different language. Maybe they're just different. Maybe they look the same, but maybe their brain works a little differently. My brain works a little differently than yours, and yours, and yours, and yours, and maybe the same as yours. But, you know, it's important 
to get along with people that aren't the same as us. And do you know why that's important? Oh, sorry about that. She is a little nervous and a little drooly. There we go. It's important, no, uh, come back, thank you. It's important to get along with people who aren't the same as us so we can share Jesus with them. What do you think about that? Has anyone ever told you that before? Hi, baby. Just like Tempe loves me and wants to do what I like her to do, because she and I have a relationship. I'm her mommy. Well, kind of. Um, God, we love God. Oh, hi, baby. We love God, and he wants us to do something, too. He wants us to share Jesus with the people around us. So I want Tempe to protect these other animals that are not the same, and God wants me to help other people that are not the same as me to know Jesus. So the important thing here is, not only livestock guardian dogs are awesome, but we need to remember that we need to get along with the people who are different. And you know, I will admit, sometimes I have a hard time with that. Sometimes I see someone and I think, oh, and then once I get to know them, I'm like, oh, like I can understand what's going on. Because if I don't get to know them, then, then I can't be useful, can I? I mean, not to them. And I love people, and I want to get to know people, and I want to share Jesus with people. And I know I don't do a very good job at that sometimes, but that's what I want, and that's what God wants me to do too. All right, do I have a volunteer to pray? Okay, I will pray. Let's pray. We're going to pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for making us who we are, that you love us just the way you made us. Thank you that you give us the opportunity to grow and learn and to share you with others. Help us to accept the people who are different so we can share you with them. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you would like to pet Tempe, you may do so. She loves people. Stand up, turn around, find someone you haven't spoken to in a while. And if you can't do that, that's a good thing because we want to be inviting and engaging in our church. So go ahead and say hello and let's warm our spirits up for our worship time. about how his wonders go beyond the galaxy, beyond anything we can imagine. So I invite you to sing with us as we worship our Lord and Savior. Lord of all. Lord of all creation.
about how powerful God's nature is, sometimes it can be overwhelming. But the words in this next hymn, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, all we have to say is holy, 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 and he knows what we're thinking, and we can feel his presence in our lives. So most of the song is very familiar to us, it's found in our hymnal, but there's a new part, and it talks about from the cradle to the cross, God is with us, he chose, Jesus chose to be with us, and that promise is beyond anything that we can ever imagine. So please sing with us as we sing holy, holy, holy.
with us, and we can feel his presence and his power. And if you feel like you need to come forward as we enter into our time of prayer, now is the time to do so. If you'd feel more comfortable sitting down as we open our hearts to this time of prayer, please do so. Because our hearts open is what really matters. So again, I invite you up if you have a special request. But please join with us as we sing, We Are His Hands. time as we break our pray to the Lord. Lord, we humbly come before you in your name this Sabbath morning. We thank you for bringing us through this week. Many have gone through trials that were hard to bear this week and in the past, and I am certain that people within the sound of my voice found situations that were unbearable and they felt alone. Lord, you promised that you would answer our prayers and heal our distresses. We know that you are our strength. If we but trust in you, you are as immovable as Mount Zion that cannot be shaken, but will abide there forever. We pray for those who have special needs, special requests at this time. We pray for those who are war-torn areas such as Ukraine, Iran, Afghanistan, and in other countries that are being persecuted for your name's sake. Please watch over them. Also, Lord, we present those who have health concerns, such as Lothar uh, Sukert and Gunter Sukert, Priscilla Winslow, Larry Curtis, Linda Oldman, Beth and Rich Lamoureux, uh, Dan Morris, and others in the prayer list, and others not on the prayer list, Lord, that you know about. We also pray for those who have lost loved ones, such as um, Gary Raymond's death this week. We miss him. He was one of a group of Wednesday get-togethers that we've done for several years, about seven of us. And we present them in your prayers, and we pray that you will be with Sue in a special way and her family. Please comfort them. We also pray for our speaker today, Nicole Boucher. 
Touch your lips with the coals from on high. We thank you for your promises in our midst, presence in our midst. Please bless us, each one. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading today is found in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. It's also found on the front page of your bulletin. You can follow along. And it reads, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I become as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I become as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partakers of it with you. May God add his blessings to his word. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> All right, let's wake this up here. Okay. All right, so before we really get into it, I just want to see for my little ones out there, did you guys get a copy of the sermon activity booklet? Let me see it if you have it. Hold it up. All right. Cool. So some of you may know, um, we normally have kids worship. And so when I was asked to speak today, I said, but we have kids worship. So today everybody gets to be involved in kids worship. <laughs> so um, for the children, we have our activity booklets and you guys are going to follow along in the sermon with your activity booklet. And if you're really little, you might need a parent to help you. But um, I just wanted to kind of explain what this is, is so that you know um, what, what you're doing with it. So we're just going to see if this wakes up here. There we go. All right. Technology is cooperating with us. We're ready to go. All right. So before we pray, I just also want to show the kids. So this is, you can't see it. <laughs> so we have a list of words, keywords. I'll just say them. Hopefully Ed will be able to get it back up on the screen. But we have a few words that I want you guys to listen for throughout the sermon today. They are discipleship, community, Christ, labor, relationship, freedom, serve, Moses, mission, kingdom, church, and of course, Jesus. So these are all important words that help us to remember some of the bigger concepts. What's up? There it goes. Okay. So these words are some words that help us to remember some of the bigger concepts. And like I said, each one of you have a sermon activity book. So as we go through today's sermon, I want you to spend some time engaging in the activities because they're going to better help you to understand what we're talking about and how you can make it practical in your own life. All right, you guys ready? Pencils ready? All right. So some of you might recognize these pictures. What are these pictures of? How would you describe these pictures? Don't be sick. Baby pictures. Okay, exactly. Babies. But these babies are not just any babies. These babies 
are some of our very own CC kids, and some of them are our college church leaders. Hint, this one here, let's see if I can point to it. The one at the end is Pastor Ron. <laughs> All right. So the truth of the matter is that we were all babies at one time. And as babies, did we know everything? Yes. <laughs> all right. No, most of us did not know everything as babies. So whether you are seven, uh, most of us didn't know everything as babies. So how did we learn? By going to school. But what about before school? We learn from other people, right? We learn through imitation. So our parents will clap with us, giggle, cover your eyes. Whatever you do, babies will copy you. Yet babies are not the only ones who learn by imitation. So did you know that your brothers, your sisters, um, your friends, they're also watching you? And for this very reason, God's word tells us to be a good example. Being a good example may mean thinking more about what others need rather than our own preferences, or even choosing to limit our own freedom for the sake of others. And with those limitations can come greater opportunities to point others in the right direction. Sort of like what Miss Michelle was sharing in the children's story. So whether you're seven, 17, or 77, we can influence people's lives by making wise choices as we live for Jesus. So before we more closely examine this concept, I invite you to pray with me. Lord of heaven, Father, we are so thankful for this holy Sabbath day that you set apart and sanctified for us. Father, as I humbly submit to you, I pray that you will put your words in my mouth, Lord. Guide me and teach us all something more about who you are and who we are because of your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, what does it mean to be a servant to all? Well, there are a few definitions, but these two I really, really like. So one, a servant is a person who performs duties for others. And two, a servant is a devoted and helpful follower or supporter. And why it resonated with me is because God calls each one of us to devote our lives in service to him by serving others. And everyone that we're called to serve, our family, our community, our friends, has preferences or ways that they like to go about doing things. So maybe you like your food prepared a certain way or you like a particular trail when you're out hiking. For my bigger kids, we often have preferred styles of communication, text, email, phone, smoke signals, don't talk to me at all, <laughs> and socialization. And these are examples of preferences. A person's preferences may or may not seem important to you. However, by setting aside what we think is the best way we can make room for others and show that we care about them by demonstrating a biblical principle known as deference. Can you say that with me, kids? Deference. Come on, guys, don't be shy. Deference. Deference, there we go. Okay, good. So what is deference? Deference tells people that you prefer others above yourself and that you want to be a blessing to them. The opposite of deference is rudeness. Say that with me. Rudeness. Rude people are unpleasant to be around because they only seem to think about themselves, what they like, how they want to do things, and what's important to them. Do we like to play with people like that? No. Do we want to be around people like that? Not usually, right? So they're only concerned with their own preferences. God wants us to live out deference daily. So let's examine some of the ways that he shows us how to do so practically. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be reading in chapter 9, but before we get there, we're going to take a look at the context that the scriptures give us in chapter 8. Okay, so 1 Corinthians, and we're going to 
be reading in chapter 9, but let's start in chapter 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we find Paul having just finished ministering in Athens, and now he's traveled to Corinth. Well known for his outspoken commitment to Jesus Christ, he spent his days discipling new believers in the faith and writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Paul knew that as a minister, he had a biblical right or freedom to expect financial support from believers. However, Paul was teaching that men ought to work hard so that they could have food and support their families and help other believers. And if he taught this, this very principle without doing the work himself, do you think people would question him? Probably so, right? Because he wasn't leading by example. So seeing the impact of his example, Paul willingly set aside this freedom and worked to support himself as he was ministering to others. In other words, Paul's deference avoided an offense that could have had a negative impact on his mission. So now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 9 because Paul understood that there was more to exercising his freedom than what he wasn't entitled to, more than doing what was convenient or suitable for his own comfort. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 19, Paul says this, though I am free and belong to who? No one. I have made myself a slave to who? Why? To win as many as possible, right? Paul continues, to the Jews I became like a Jew. Why? To win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. Why? To win, right? Uh, to the weak, I became weak. Why? To win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save how many? Some. Okay. You see, Paul, and, and actually let's continue it to 23. Why does he do this? Verse 23, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. You see, Paul consistently pursued one goal. One goal, and that was to win people to Jesus so that he could have an influence on them for the gospel. Paul is willing and looking for opportunities to adapt himself to the local culture, the local conversation, the local context, so that he can become what? All things to who? All people because of the gospel. You see, six times in this passage, he makes reference to saving the lost. He understood something about the heart of our God, the creator of the universe. Paul knew who he was and who he had become because of who God is, not because of what he knew intellectually. Because of what Jesus had done for him, because of the way that God took him and molded him into his image and gave him the mind of Christ. It was out of this experience that Paul felt a sense of urgency when it came to mission. Because mission for Paul did not come from an obligation. It did not come from a generational sense of obligatory duty to serve in the church. It wasn't something that Paul fit into his life. No, it was out of a heart of deep recognition of the life-changing experience of encountering the one who made him whole. And Paul was so persuaded of this beautiful truth and so in love with the God of this truth that his singular focus became what? To win as many as possible. In the book Evangelism, 
Ellen White has a quote, and before we go there, I just want to say this. It wasn't about theory for Jesus, and it wasn't about theory for Paul. It was and always has been about relationships, not by Paul's knowledge, but by his willingness to come into fellowship, to build community with them all. Paul sought to win people to Jesus by being sensitive to their needs and identifying with them, earning their trust and serving as an example to them. So what does that look like practically? We're gonna look at evangelism, the book Evangelism by Ellen White. And she says in this book, in regard to making known our faith, no decided effort should be made to conceal it. Don't hide it, right? Don't hide it, don't shy away from it. But also, no unwise efforts put forth to make it prominent. Don't highlight the differences. Persons will come to the sanitarium, to the hospital, who are in favorable condition to be impressed by the truth. If they ask questions in regard to our faith, it would be proper to state what we believe in a clear, simple manner. Indwelling godliness imparts a power to, conduct, uh, to the conduct of the true believer that gives him an influence for the right. She continues, but in this matter, we should act with what? discretion. There are conscientious persons who think it their duty to talk freely upon the points of faith on which there is a difference of opinion in a manner which arouses combativeness of those with whom they converse. One such premature injudicious effort may close the ears of one who otherwise would have patiently would have heard patiently, but who will now influence others unfavorably. Thus spring up the roots of bitterness, whereby many are defiled through the indiscretion of one, and the ears and hearts of many may be closed to the truth. Here's one more example. Ministry of healing. We are to live not to guard our feelings or our reputation, but to what? Save souls. As we become interested in the salvation of souls, we cease to mind the little differences that so often arise in our association with one another. What Ellen White is calling for, what Paul is calling for, what Jesus is calling for, is selfless accommodation in the interest of reaching the lost. Not by big numbers, but through big impact, which stems directly from thoughtfulness, discretion and intentionality in service and is measured at the microscopic individual level. Friends, who are we trying to reach as a church? And why are we trying to reach them? Are we looking to assimilate those who we meet to our way, our preferences, our way of doing things, and living, or are we honoring the individuality and making space for community? Are we reaching others with culture or principle? Because you see, culture seeks to assimilate, whereas principle seeks to transform. And while we're at it, how are we measuring how successful we've been in our reach? Because if it's anything other than the transformational work of the Holy Spirit, then we're getting it wrong. And I'm not talking about baptisms or the size of events. I'm, I'm talking about those fractional changes, those fractional successes, those almost imperceptible changes that we see that indicate that someone is moving closer to having a positive relational dynamic with the Lord. Changes in thoughts, perceptions, actions, behaviors that change over time as a reflection as the time spent with a positive influence. Who are we trying to reach and why are we trying to reach them? If we don't know this, then can we really know how to reach them? We're spending hours and hours and hours devising strategies of how we can have an impact in our community. How can we live out the gospel and bring about restoration and healing and transformation in our communities? But we're missing key information. 
How can we develop effective ministry? How can we live out our calling, our mission, our purpose, individually or as a church community, if we don't understand the methods by which to do so? Do you know, Paul starts in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, do you know that in a race, all the runners run? How many? All the runners run. But how many get the prize? Just one. So run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, and here's what we need to understand when we're talking about making an impact for Jesus. Therefore, I do not run like someone running what? Aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. You see, Paul strikes to make it count. Every effort, no matter how large or small, every effort has potential. And with a coordinated, orderly, intentional effort to engage with one another and with our community, we can make it count. We can make it count. So if you're feeling tired and aimless, directionless, stagnant as a faith community. What am I doing? What is my purpose? What is my calling? Why am I here? I come here every Sabbath and it's the same thing over and over again. If you're feeling like that, no, we just don't have enough information for impact, but Jesus shows us a way. How do we get more information? You see, what Paul did what Jesus did, they spoke the language and entered into the world of those who they were ministering to with intention, authenticity, and a singular focus on the salvation of souls. They worked hard to find opportunities to build those bridges. Yes, Paul was persuaded he knew his identity and in whom he believed, and out of an abundance of gratitude, his heart responded with service. The image of God, the one who was so others-centered, so selflessly aware of the needs of the children, the one who emptied himself and laid aside the glories of heaven to come humbly to earth and die a terrible death, in order that we might be saved, desires to restore that same image in us. So I wonder, do we know who we are? Do we have a firm grasp on our Christian identity? Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. That's community. He showed sympathy for them. That's connection. He ministered to their needs. Deference. He won their confidence. That's fellowship. That's friendship. And then he invited them to follow me. That's discipleship. That's the model. That's what we follow. Do we know who we are? Do we have a firm grasp on our Christian identity and what it's all for? Do we? Paul did, and his purpose was for the sake of the gospel. But what about for you? What about for me? Do we understand, have we embraced what the gospel is fully about? Do we understand it? Are we living it? Experiencing it in an authentic way to motivate us to share with others? The early Adventist movement began with Christians from various denominations that were seeking to be established in the truth of scripture. 
and they were awaiting the soon coming of Jesus. But the early Adventists were also known for something else. The Second Advent Movement was inseparable from the abolitionist call for the immediate and total destruction of slavery and a demand for the equal rights of the oppressed. I'm gonna say that again. The abolitionist call was inseparable from the Second Advent Movement. And it called for the immediate and total destruction, total destruction of slavery and demand for equal rights for the oppressed. Do you see what I'm seeing here? We all understand and acknowledge that it was God who established the Second Advent Movement, which we know as Adventism, based on our biblical understanding of prophecies from the book of Daniel and Revelation. And the heart of this message, the heart of this movement is what? The soon coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now watch this, the Second Advent Movement was inseparable from the abolitionist call. What is abolitionism? What is abolitionism? A movement to end slavery. So in other words, God established a people to prepare and warn the world for his soon return and a core component, a foundational element of that movement was a call to end slavery. It was a call for freedom. From the rise of the Millerite movement in the early 1830s through the end of the Civil War, Adventists of all varieties used the tactic of moral suasion to warn pro-slavery Americans that God would soon return and judge them if they did not immediately repent and reform. In this manner, they made protest inseparable from their Adventist faith. And when I say protest, I'm not talking about marching up and down the streets with picket signs. Protests following Christ's method by getting close, by entering the world to pull others out, to bring light into the darkness. Throughout the entire antebellum period, Millerites and Seventh-day Adventists risked their lives to liberate slaves from bondage. They risked their lives. Are we still Adventists today? Are we waiting, watching, and preparing our hearts and minds for the soon coming of Christ? Are we? Yes. Do we believe that? Yes. So we have to understand much better than we do, not only how we are leading, but where we are leading. We don't want to be aimless. We want to make it count. Where are you leading us? This question sounds really familiar. It's the one that the children of Israel asked repeatedly as they were being led by Moses through the wilderness. Where was Moses leading the children of Israel? Where was he leading them? To the promised land, okay? Well, in Exodus 20, and you can turn there in your Bibles if you'd like, we're just gonna look at one verse. In Exodus 20, God tells us exactly where they were being led. And it wasn't just a physical location, like a building, a class, or an event, no. How does Exodus 20 start? Verse two, I am, right? I am, God begins in verse two of Exodus 20. I am Yahweh, the Lord your God. Notice the personal relationship there. Not I am the Lord, a God. Not I am the Lord, the God, I am the Lord what? Your God, who did what? Rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your what? 
slavery. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, out of bondage, freedom. That's where God led them through the obedience of Moses. It could have been any land. Could God have made any space flowing with milk and honey, beautiful with all the provisions? No, he was leading them to something much deeper than a physical, geographical location. He was leading them out of bondage. He was rescuing them. He was setting them free. That's where he's leading us all to. The heart of the gospel, the foundation of Jesus' work and ours, is freedom. And here's the really amazing part of this. The overarching narrative reveals that this isn't something far removed from some far distant God, but he's the covenant-keeping, relational God of Scripture, Yahweh, that is God with us in our bondage and the God who delivers us from our bondage. Galatians 5.13, turn there with me if you'd like. Galatians 5.13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Called by who? God. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. You see, it's not about what we know. Rather, it has to do with how one lives and behaves among those whom we wish to influence for the kingdom. When we're driven by the overarching narrative, how we can positively influence somebody for Jesus, how we can reveal the power and the beauty of the gospel through action, and as Paul has shown us, and as Jesus has proven to us, is that it is a present show up, be available kind of work that seeks to build up through love and respect toward one another, through community, through intention, and a willingness to live in such a way that we place others before ourselves and are willing to meet people where they are. Christ's mission was to heal the brokenhearted and to set captives free. We see that in Isaiah 61.1. We were free first by creation. We found ourselves in bondage because of sin. And then we were set free by redemption, hallelujah, for the purpose of mission, for service, for a sacrificial, other-centered, deferential approach that we may reach all with the hopes of saving some for what? The sake of of the gospel, for freedom, for love. Friends, Jesus' desire is to restore us spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically, and relationally. The big picture of scripture is a reflection of the interconnected complexity of the Godhead. It is a foundational element of love that is rooted in the principle of three in which it is the presence of, the, of that third distinct person that becomes the test of love. If spiritual maturity, spiritual growth could be deduced to the restoration of the relational dynamic between me and God alone, that's a selfish love. Because in it, love, God's love is bestowed upon me and I in turn give him my love. And we're just loving on each other. Forget about all this. But when we introduce that third component, when we introduce another individual, now the strength of that love is tested because now we have to accept that the love of God is bestowed not only upon us, not only upon me, but upon others as well. And that the love that we have for God is not our isolated experience. It's not just for us. 
our preferences, our understanding alone, rather than the others, we have to understand uh, that it's not just our preferences, our understanding alone, rather than the others have their own experience and relationship with God that is unique, and yet it's interconnected with our own experience. And then we then have to defer to accept or to humbly submit to the presence and experience of that individual. And when we do so, that love, the character that God desires to de develop within us, that image, his image, that he so desires to restore in us is made perfect. And the manifestation of not only our relationship with God, but in our relationship with others. So I invite you to stand as we close our service with our closing hymn. you to bow your heads. Father in heaven, you resist the proud and give grace for every situation only as we humble ourselves. We thank you for your unfailing love, your grace and mercy towards us. We thank you for your purpose, for mission, and for granting us the privilege to be a part of your great plan of salvation. We have been set free. Help us to live like it, to love like it, and to make space for others to experience it by laying aside our own comforts, desires, and freedoms so that we can show your love to them as we learn to put them first. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>